Forced to work from home by your employer? Laid off or feeling depressed at home? Do you want to make money working from anywhere? We'll show you how to do it from your couch. It's time for another episode of the Work From Home Show. Coming to you from their homes in Austin, Texas and Tampa, Florida. Here are your hosts, Adam and Naresh. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Work From Home Show. Shout out to all our homies, homeboys, homegirls, home trans, all the work from homers out there. I'm Naresh Vissa. Adam Schrader is not able to join us today. We have a very, very special interview. We do a lot of interviews, but I would say this is one of the most special. I would put it in our top five Hall of Fame list. The reason is because we did, when we started the Work From Home show, we did a few episodes. I want to say maybe two or three episodes covering or touching on the documentary, the Netflix, the hit Netflix docuseries, Tiger King. And we have probably one of the two megastars, I'd say, from that docuseries. And she is none other than Carol Baskin, CEO of Big Cat Rescue. And like I said, megastar of the hit Netflix docuseries, Tiger King. Carol, welcome to the Work From Home show. Hey, all you cool cats and kittens who are working from home. (laughs) Yes, that's exactly what we are. A little bit more about your background. You also run a real estate business. We'll talk about that a little bit because I'm curious to learn more, especially how it ties into all the acres of land that you own. Uh, You also manage 100 plus volunteers and interns from around the world. You should definitely talk about that. That's pretty impressive as well as tens of staff and contractors. You have run the Tampa Bay nonprofit, that's Big Cat Rescue, since 1992. You've garnered, like I mentioned, international attention from CNN, Animal Planet, Discovery, U.S. News, and World Report, National Geographic, People Magazine, Netflix, of course, Sports Illustrated, The list goes really after Tiger King. I think every media outlet possible covered not just Tiger King, but also you personally. So you've been everywhere. Literally, I'm I'm not even exaggerating when I say that. Like you've been you've been everywhere. And then, of course, the local media outlets. I live in Tampa Bay, so I know you're in, in Tampa Bay and we can talk a little bit about that. And uh, you're also the host of the Cat Chat Show, which is a live interview with cat experts from around the world. Of course, you are one of the foremost big cat experts in the world. So Carol Baskin, once again, it truly is an honor and a pleasure. There's just a lot to get to. I have a I want to talk about a lot because I think uh, you're you're working on a, a few initiatives, some political initiatives, and without Tiger King, uh, I don't know if if you would have made this much because I had never even heard of. I live in Tampa Bay. I'd never even heard of Big Cat Big Cat Rescue or Carol Baskin until until the docu series came out. Yeah, the Chamber of Commerce used to call us Tampa's best kept secret. <laughs> well, after the the Tiger King came out, you're no longer a secret, and now people from around the world, when they think of Tampa Bay, they think, oh, that's where that that cat that cat zoo is uh so that that's pretty cool I'm, I'm curious to know did you expect when they were filming tiger king did you think it was just another you've been in plenty of documentaries did you think this was just another documentary like on animal planet or something and uh or did you actually expect this would become at the time and, and it may even be currently the most watched docuseries of all time at, at least on netflix We were working with them for five years on a documentary that they said was going to be called Stolen World. And it was supposed to be about how all of these exotic animals are treated so badly by people that are using them to make a living. And so we thought it would be an accurate depiction of the entire industry and figured nobody would watch it because people just don't care about real life issues for the most part, they wanna be entertained. <clears throat> they tried to sell it to CNN, and when CNN failed to buy it, apparently they went through a total different re-editing, changed their entire format, um, different 
producers were brought in and they turned it into the freak show that became Tiger King that they sold to Netflix. That's impressive. So, yeah, I'm I'm not surprised it, it that they must have spent a lot of money on the initial idea and concept. And based on what you said, I, I think the timing worked out because we covered the show. We started our show in March 2020. So the timing was very, very it, it, it was spot on as far as pandemic hits. People are locked at home. And what do they do? They watch Tiger King. They watch Carol Baskin. Like, uh, it, it, it just really worked out for Netflix. Did, what feedback did you get at the height of the pandemic when the show came out and even after the show? When it first came out and they were advertising it, we didn't even recognize it as the show that we had been working on, except for the fact that there seemed to be clips that involved us. And so we contacted the producers and we're like, who's working on that show? Because usually everybody in that industry knows everybody else. And we were working on a lot of different shows at the time. And we got like crickets back from them. So my husband and I sat down and we binge watched it like everybody else did, I think. And we sat through <laughs> seven episodes of it. And then we just turned and looked at each other and said, well, that was a missed opportunity. <laughs> and for us, we just thought, God, we spent five years with these people and they really didn't understand how horrible the sub petting is and all of these people with these big cats in their backyards. And they glamorized one of the people that we felt was one of the worst in the industry. And so we just felt like it was a missed opportunity. But about five minutes after that last show rolled, my phone started blowing up. And every five minutes for the next... <sighs> three months, it was ringing off the hook day and night. I had to turn it off at night because I couldn't even sleep because it was ringing so much. And it was people mostly calling and screaming at me how much they hated me because they said I was just like Joe Exotic because I had cats in cages and I should turn them all loose. And I'm thinking, whose neighborhood do you want me to turn all of these tigers loose in? Are you out of your freaking minds? But, you know, it gave me a chance to educate the people that I could and my online team was amazing and they dealt with so much vitriol and hatefulness from people who thought that I had just ruined Joe's life by telling him he couldn't have tigers as pets that it took a long time for us to be able to well it wasn't just that he couldn't have tigers it was telling him that he couldn't kill you <laughs> well, yeah there's that too <laughs> <laughs> so um <clears throat> Yeah, well, it was it was definitely a, a, entertainment, but it's re it was a real. It, this wasn't fake. That's that's the other thing. It seemed like some kind of true crime fictional serial, but no, this was you're a real person who I'm talking. Like you were the the real Carol Baskin. You're not some fictionalized character. You know, everybody who has come up to me in person has been lovely. I've not had one mean person in person. It's just the people who can hide behind a screen that are so hateful. But the people who come up to me, the thing I hear most from them is they say, you got me through COVID. And they seem to think that I was like playing some kind of part in a fictional um, yeah. presentation. And I, I, I just, I'm baffled at that, how they don't realize that that was a real thing. So you mentioned, I, I want to talk a little bit about the cats and people said, oh, you're a bad person, you own cats, you should let them free. Well, I'm, now I'm curious because where do they, I hear this all the time. I, I go to a zoo, I go, I'm watching a circus and I hear people saying, oh, it's so bad what they're doing to these animals. And I have your response, which is, well, what do you just ship them off to the jungle? Or like, is that is that what these people want? want the, the elephants and the tigers and the lions? Is that where they want them to end up? I think that they've gotten bad messaging for probably their whole lives because I think most of us were raised being taken to zoos. That seems to be a thing to do with your kids is to take them to a zoo. And zoos realized probably 20 or 30 years ago that the public was starting to ask questions about, well, why are these animals in cages? Why are you breeding them? And so they started justifying their existence by saying, oh, we're breeding them for conservation and people have to see them up close or they're not going to protect them in the wild. And what we've seen over the past 200 years of zoos is that that has led just about every exotic cat species right to the edge of extinction. 
And so what we need to do is save the cats in the wild where they belong. And I would, I would hope when uh, you mentioned I have several plans for the future, but my biggest plan for the future is to have zoos reinvent themselves by using internet streaming cameras in the wild where those cats are that then are brought into their either their facilities or into headsets within their facilities where they can create sort of a location based experience where you put on the headset and you're in the Himalayas watching the snow leopard do what it's really doing in real time and they could add the cold air blowing on you or the smell of the yak stew from the monk's tent next door you know all of those kinds of things that make you feel like you're actually right there and if all of that were done through a subscription fee just like you pay for Netflix then that money could actually through cryptocurrencies be dropped right into Whoa. the wallets of the people who live in the wild next to those cats making them game wardens in effect okay well that answer we got to talk that that was an awesome i was not expecting that so first off i want to clarify some things and secondly i want to talk about the crypto stuff because i was not expecting that at all so you're saying that people should go to like the zoo they can do they wouldn't be able to do this at home they would be they should go to like a zoo and pay money and this is almost like an experience that they can participate in type of thing well, I think you could do both. I mean, obviously, if it's available on the internet, you could do it at home, but not everybody can afford a $500 quest. And so if you can't afford that, okay, you go pay your $5 to the local zoo and you use their quest. And the same thing goes with the subscription fee. You know, I might be able to subscribe to my top 10 favorite cat channels, but I couldn't subscribe to every cat channel in the world if if all of the zoos were doing this and they had cameras in all of the places where these animals live free, then the only way I'd get to see a lot of those channels would be to go to the zoo. Now this quest is, are, are you working on this technology? Are you working with different companies or is this just an idea you have? We've actually created a prototype here at Big Cat Rescue with just live webcams. We have about 42 live webcams at the sanctuary that are on captive cats and people can watch those for free. What we're trying to do is get people used to the idea of wanting to see cats that way instead of having them held captive or bred for captivity in zoos. And to, to make a differentiation between zoos and sanctuaries, Zoos are in the business of having animals in cages to attract the public. Yes. Sanctuaries are in the business, if you can call it that, of fundraising mostly to be able to take care of all of the cast offs from all of those horrible things that people do, whether it's cub petting, which is now illegal thanks to our federal bill passing on the 20th, or um, you know, even the breeding for these zoos. People wanna see babies. They don't wanna see last year's babies. They wanna see new babies. And so they have to get rid of them. And so a lot of sanctuaries will take those animals in. We won't take an animal in unless the person giving up the animal agrees to never have another exotic cat. But because we don't want to just create that, you know, keep that cycle spinning. But I really think that zoos could make a huge difference in conservation by doing these virtual type experiences. So we've been trying to show them ways that that can happen. The cameras to do that in 360, where you could actually, you know, put on the headset and you're looking around in the environment and able to see everything in 360 degrees. Those are super expensive right now, but just like any kind of technology, it's going to get cheaper. And, okay, so you guys already have somewhat of this prototype at your zoo, correct? Or at not yours, I don't want to call it a zoo, your big cat rescue. It's, sanctu it's sanctuary, yeah. Sanctuary. We have the live webcams and we produced gosh, probably 500 videos that are in 183D. And uh, those are all available on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash big cat rescue. Just look for the playlist of 3D or 360 videos. And when you see those cats like that, it's like you're right there. You can get so much closer with the camera than you could ever get in a zoo or a sanctuary type setting because <laughs> they would tear your fingers off if your fingers were that close, whereas the camera is protected by its casing. And you see things that you'd never be able to see or hear any other way. So we are trying to get people to adopt wanting that and demanding more of that. And we've just started on that since 2019. That's pretty cool. So is is that a huge reason why people should visit Big Cat Rescue? Like if I came... 
I have two young children, so if I brought them, would we be able to experience this at your location or it's only at home? Well, you would have been able to <laughs> before COVID hit. Um, and we also opened two augmented reality zoos, one in the mall here in Tampa, the Citrus Park Mall, and one down in Homestead. And both of those are still up and running, but we don't have a paid person there to put the headset on you and guide you through this that experience anymore. As for the sanctuary, we've been closed since March, March 15th of 2020. That's when everything shut down here in Tampa. And then <laughs> Tiger King came out five days later and people were threatening to burn the place down. So we never have reopened. I would have thought that the show helped helped your uh, big cat rescue the show because like i said it was yes it was a lot of negativity but it was also a lot of oh i never even knew this existed let me go check it out or i have some young children and they love tigers and lions like let's go visit yeah the first three months or so until i was on dancing with the stars and people saw that i wasn't the person that i was made to be in tiger king until then, we were really concerned that people coming to the sanctuary might try to harm the animals because so many of them said they felt like the cats were better off dead than in cages. And I think the cats might disagree with that. So, um, but what happened was by the time Dancing with the Stars came out in September of 2020, they had learned that cats, and especially big cats, can die from COVID. And so that's why we never reopened because COVID is still making all different kinds of <laughs> reinventions of itself and we don't want to expose our cats to the public that way so even though big cat rescue isn't open to the public it's still it's still there you still have cats correct yes. Yes. and you're still raising okay are you planning to open it back i'm kind of sad that it's closed i really wanted to bring my kids i really wanted to go myself <laughs> there's two things that probably would prevent me from ever reopening one is that I think these pandemics are here to stay and I think it's just going to be every year there's some new thing that is crossing that boundary between animals and humans that I would not want to expose the cats to. And the other is that while we were closed for the last three years, what we did was we opened up a lot of our empty cages so that where a cat may have had 1800 square feet, we might open up three more, four more of those 1800 square foot cages that were empty so the cat had four of those to go in. And when they have that much space, they're not choosing to be around people. So you could walk around, and I do this all the time, you could walk around there for hours and maybe see three cats because they're just doing their thing and we don't force them to be on display. So I think the public would never really be happy with what they saw. And that's why we put in the 42 cameras, because we have cameras trained on the places that the cats like to lay around the most. Understood. And if I'm not mistaken, if, if the documentary is accurate, you took over Joe Exotic's property in Oklahoma, didn't you? His zoo there. Is it, do you still own that? Is that still operating? No. Um, when the court awarded us the zoo, his partner, Jeff Lowe, moved all of the animals down to Thackerville. And eventually the uh, department... Is that in Oklahoma also? It is. It's about yeah. an hour south of there. And I think it was the Department of Justice ended up suing him. PETA was involved in suing him and um, they ended up confiscating all the animals. But once we got possession of the zoo, there were no more animals in it. And we sold it as fast as we could with the caveat that it never be used for housing uh, wild animals again. If somebody wanted to have a goat farm there or a horse farm or something like that, that'd be fine, but not any wild animals in cages. Talking about the misnomer uh, about you and just we're about 15 to 20 minutes into this interview. And yeah, I heard a lot of negativity about you after Netflix and I never understood it. Number one, because I worked in media for a while, so I, I get it that they're all about the eyeballs. So I, I understand the spin and I'm not one to just fall for for anything. But but secondly, it is there was no case against you like I, I don't understand how they built up such a such vitriol against you when there were just no facts no nothing especially your ex-husband and what happened there I mean there was like no evidence no facts nothing and uh it just kind of boggles me how you became the bad person and how people just jumped to conclusions saying 
oh, she's the real murderer. Like, I just never understood it. If someone can show me some kind of fact, I believe even uh, Sheriff, not not Sheriff <laughs> Chronister, but the Hillsborough County at the time, 20 years ago or whenever this happened, they investigated, they investigated again in 2020, and the, there was just nothing to, to it. Yeah, and in Tiger King, too, I was shocked to see that the person that they kept saying was our attorney, our family attorney, Joseph Fritz in Tiger King and Tiger King 2. He may have represented Don in a case or two, but he wasn't our family attorney. But at any rate, apparently he knew somebody in the FBI and they got him a copy of a document from Homeland Security saying that Don Lewis was alive and well in Costa Rica. And that that had to have been at least five years after I saw him last because Homeland Security didn't even exist until after the Twin Towers went down in 2002. Mm. So, you know, even though that came out in Tiger King 2, it seems like nobody saw it because people still ask me the same questions all the time about it. And it's like, who, who would you rather believe, a bunch of animal abusers or Homeland Security as to what happened to Don? So do you think Don is alive in Costa Rica? It's not a bad place to skip town. I've been there before. Yeah, we had a lot of property down in Costa Rica, but he hasn't seemed to have touched any of it since then. And I didn't think that there was any way he could support himself because I believe that he had Alzheimer's. I was trying to get him to a doctor at the time that he disappeared. But what they also revealed in Tiger King 2 from the people that he was living with down there and his neighbors and <laughs> Uh, his personal driver and his attorney and <laughs> his guy that set up all of his businesses for him is that he was running brothels with underage children. And that's the kind of thing you could do, even if you didn't have your wits completely about you, because sadly, people will always pay for that. And so that that made sense to me that if he's surviving on his own down there, that's the only way he could have done it. I want to talk a little bit about you talk you, you mentioned that the federal government has gotten involved December 20th 2022 uh, how have they gotten involved in preserving and protecting big cats what was it because of you was it because of Tiger King because when I see politicians <laughs> running I never see them saying that they're running to preserve big cats <laughs> yeah they got dragged kicking and screaming across this finish line Back in 1997 or 1998, I was working on a federal bill with Tippi Hedren from The Birds. She runs a sanctuary in California called Shambhala. And um, Humane Society of the United States was involved in some other NGOs. And what we were trying to do was ban private possession of big cats and end the abusive industry of how these cats are being used in America. And so we, like any bill that you get through Congress, we have a two-year Congress and you have to introduce it. You go all the way through two years, the bill dies. You have to start all over again, but you try it by getting more people each time. And so the bill that we were working on was called the Captive Wildlife Safety Act. And that passed in 2003. And in 2003, I had to turn away 312 big cats in addition to the ones that I could rescue because we were full. And all of the sanctuaries were full and overloaded. And every other year, that number was doubling. And after the bill passed in 2003, which only made it illegal to sell a big cat across state lines, the number dropped for the first time ever to 110. And so I just doubled down on that because I felt like there's no way we can rescue our way out of this with people like Joe Exotic and Doc Antle and these guys that are breeding hundreds of lion and tiger and liger cubs every year and then dumping them into private ownership. So we've been trying since 2003 to close that loophole of stopping the private ownership and stopping the cub petting. And we had gotten it all the way through the house in December of 2020. And it passed with a two thirds majority, but we only had three weeks left in the session and we could not get it through the Senate. So it died at the end of 2020. And actually there were people that were fighting the bill that kept trying to call it the Tiger King bill, even though it had been introduced every two years since 1998 as the Big Cat Public Safety Act. And so um, Tiger King did not help the bill at all. 
in 2020. But by 2021, 2022, the next two year session, I had clawed back enough of my reputation and we had built up our our co-sponsors in both the House and the Senate. We got a lot more Republicans onto the bill because it was a very um, contested environment, as you can imagine if you've been watching the news. And we got it passed through the House in July, which gave us like, five months to get it through the Senate. And we finally got it through the Senate again when we were let down to like the last two weeks of the year, we got it through the Senate. And so, or actually it was the last week of the year, we got it through the Senate and the president signed the bill into law. So it stops the cub petting right away, which is what all of the breeding and discarding is about. And then it also phases out private ownership. People who have them can keep them. They just can't buy or breed more. So this is a federal bill. This is not like a state thing. This is federal across the United States. Correct. That's that's very cool. Congratulations on that. I Thank want to talk a, a little bit about real estate because you, you own a lot of acreage and I'm sure you own a lot more that we don't even know about outside of Tiger King and outside of animal sanctuaries. Tell us a little bit about the real estate that you own. You brought up Don, he owned a bunch of, of, of real estate and I'm sure you and him together were, were partners on many deals. Just give us a little overview. Actually, when I met Don in 1980, he had a um, vacant lot that he was going to build a, a house on and he had the lot where his uh, trailer and his trucking business was. And I think he had one other piece of property that was also vacant. So all these people that say he was this, you know, big real estate mogul. No, he had three pieces of property. And in 1984, what we started doing together was he was standing in line at the bank one day and he overheard a couple of the bankers saying, man, I got this $20,000 mortgage and I'd sell it for $2,000 just to get it off our books. And so Don could only read or write at about a first grade level. So he said, well, could you make a copy of that for me and let me uh, think about it? And so he brings it to me and he's like, this just sounds too good to be true. Read it and see what the catch is. And it was in the 80s when so many people were defaulting on their loans and the banks don't want to be the bad guy that forecloses. So they would discount a $20,000 mortgage down to $2,000 just to get rid of it. But it's still worth $20,000. And the underlying property, and it was worth a whole lot more than that. So we bought the mortgage. I went to the people that owed the money and said, look, I got a huge discount on this. I could offer it to you for a whole lot less. I could make your payments a lot less if you want to keep it. And they just wouldn't do it. So I foreclosed on them, got the property. We made $20,000 on it. And Don said, can you do that again? And I was like, I don't know. Let me try. So I started driving around to every bank, every lending credit union, everything in five counties around us. And we built up a multi multi-million dollar real estate business by doing that. Wow. I did not know. OK, that's that's pretty cool. And I don't think you would be able to do something like that today because Number one, you have so many real estate investors everywhere, especially in central Florida, Tampa Bay area. So it's all about having access to information and they probably have access to the information before it gets to someone like me. But but secondly, the number of foreclosures probably aren't being discounted at such a, you know, from 20,000 to 2,000 or from 200,000 to, to 20,000. Am I correct when I say that? This looks like a unique opportunity to the 1980s. Well, it was a once in a lifetime thing with the, um, what did they call that? The Resolution Trust was liquidating everything you can imagine. I was buying duplexes for $1,000. Um, just Holy moly. Yeah. That was going to be my next, my next question was what type of asset class? So you're, you're buying apartment complexes, multifamily, duplexes, single family, commercial, retail, mobile home parks. Tell me a little more. My niche has turned out to be mostly mobile homes and it worked out well for me because this also then morphed after, you know, going through all these banking things and getting all of these properties that way. I started going to the foreclosure sales on the courthouse steps and I would buy properties that way. And from being there, I learned that there was something called a tax deed sale. And so what happens yep. is if you don't pay your taxes for three years, the county can auction off 
your property so that they get their money for the taxes. And you can often buy it really, really cheap that way. And so you're right. I mean, it was like, we were probably some of the first people to be doing that. We were, we didn't call it flipping homes like they call it now. We didn't have a name for it. It was so different and unique from what people were accustomed to, but um, it was a really good time to get started. And I still do, do, do all of that, but um, it's, it's a very competitive market now because you're right. It is all online. People have all the access and the tools and, I was thinking just yesterday, I was putting for sale signs on like seven of my properties that I've just been ignoring while I've been focused on this bill and they've just been sitting there not doing anything. So I went out and put for sale signs on a bunch of them. And it was like Google Maps makes it possible for me to just plug in all the addresses and it tells me which one to go to next. And they used to take me hours of laying out those big Rand McNally maps and plotting out our day. And we'd go look at 20 different properties and I, I'd say probably for every hundred properties that I looked at, I only bought maybe one or two. That's pretty yeah. awesome. When you say mobile homes, you mean mobile home parks? That's what you were buying through these, if you want to call them auctions or foreclosure? No, actually uh, what my niche became was to go to those auctions and buy mobile home lots. So where there was just a single lot or a piece of, you know, an acre, half acre, that was zoned for mobile homes. And then I built up a relationship with a woman who ran a mobile home park or a mobile home park, a mobile home dealership. And every year she had to have new models set on her lot and she couldn't afford, they used to like underwrite them. I forget what they call that, but like they do that with cars too. And they stopped doing it for mobile homes. So I would loan her the money to get the new model to set on her lot. And then the next year when she had to get the new one, I'd loan her money on the new one. I'd take the old one and go put it on one of my lots. And so that's how I developed that until she, her husband died. And then later she completely lost her mind and went out of business and just from age. And so I haven't had a good um, source for mobile homes since losing that relationship. And that is something I need to get back into. So that was in the 80s when you started scaling. I, I want to learn a little bit more about what type of scale are we are we talking here? Like, did you own 10, 15 properties or were they in the hundreds or, or at the peak when you own the like, just tell us like how many acres, how many properties? Like, just want to get a, a sense of what type of real estate mogul you are. <laughs> because obviously the, the, for the cats, you have to own a ton of acres. I mean. Big Cat Rescue alone, how many acres is that? 67. 67, okay. So if if we throw in all the other, the mobile home sections, like the plots of land, the the multi, like maybe how many units, like single family, multifamilies, apartment complexes, et cetera, plus acres, just give a little more detail. I think it would probably run between 80 and 150, maybe at its peak. But where you have 150, it's, you know, 150, well, what, 150, but there was a whole bunch of them were vacant lots. And so getting the mobile homes on them, you have to pay for wells and septics and moving the mobile home there and getting it set up. So there's huge investments of money into making one of those then a property that's worth a whole lot more. And I sell properties in a way that makes it affordable for people. So I sell them myself. I hardly ever use a realtor and I sell it with 12 payments on time and I just deed the property over and hold the mortgage. And so people that have no credit or who are trying to reestablish from bad credit, I don't care as long as they make 12 payments on time, I know they're going to pay me. And so it makes it easy to, to sell the properties as well. The 67 acres at the sanctuary, it started out as 40 acres and then we've, we've added on acreage around us but now acreage out there is like two hundred thousand dollars an acre which is ridiculous yeah well it's not going to get much much cheaper i was going to say the boon you had is getting started in the 80s when did big cat rescue when did you start that was that also started in the 80s 1992 still still a good time really any time before like 2015 was what was was a was a good time I, I think to to get into a lot of into motels fast food real estate mobile acres of like land just um now we're we're at a level now where if you if you held on to those well congratulations even if you sold them con- congratulations 
I was listening to a podcast by Peter Diamandis the other day, and he was talking about investing in real estate and how it being one of the best ways to generate wealth for all time. I mean, <laughs> even now. And yet what he was saying is he felt like the, the, um, the value that's created now by having held it for so long is because of the fact that the dollar has been inflated so much. And so it's not really that the value of the property has gone up so much as it takes so many more dollars to buy it. And I thought that was an interesting concept. I'd never really thought of it that way. Yeah, part of it is dollars for sure. But the other part of it is just the idea of of population growth. So we're seeing where we are today, the, the number of people who live in, around the world is far greater than the number of people who lived 100 years ago or 200 years ago. Life expectancy, despite the pandemic, has gone up. I mean, over the last three years because of the pandemic, it's gone down. But if you look at a 50 year time period, 100 year time period, life expectancy has gone up. You know, back in, in the early 90s, people were passing. It was it was like common for people to pass in their 50s. Like you die in your 50s and it's like, oh, they lived a long life. Now, if that happens today, it's like, oh, my God, like that's so young. He, he's, how can that happen? So I, I think a lot of it has to do with when you have more people inhabiting I don't know about, I can't speak about the animals, but if you, when you have more people, well, those people are going to use up resources, are going to use up space, right? They need places to live. They want to do stuff. So that's where real estate comes in. It's it's very useful. And that's why moving forward, we're, we're about to see a baby boom, uh, at least in the United States. And most of the world is heading that direction of, you know, we need more babies. We need more people in this world, uh, consumerism, et cetera. So that's also the idea instead of we're now replacing the dollar with with people and it's like okay more people chasing a fixed amount of land a fixed amount of houses a fixed amount of whatever imagine if there were so many cats right and you you were the only sanctuary in the in, in the world i mean all the cats are going to be using you won't be able to fit all of them right and imagine if you charge the cats i mean wow that's a huge money maker if they just want to be able to live so that's that's the general idea behind real estate and that's why I'm completely on board with it. I think real estate is great. I think globalization has really had a huge impact on it too, because what I've seen at the auctions is that there are so many foreign investors now that we didn't see back in the 80s and 90s. And I think it's because they recognize the United States as being stable, <laughs> more stable maybe than a lot of other yeah. places on the planet and a good place for them to park money. Absolutely. And that's something that a lot of the America haters or the detractors of America, all they look at is the negative, but they don't see the positive that, hey, you know what? Everyone still wants to like literally everyone. If, if somebody wants to leave their home country, the first place they're thinking is I want to go to the United States. Even Prince Harry and, and Meghan, they wanted to get out of, of the palace. They wanted to get out of London. First thing, despite saying the U.S. is racist and the U.S. not not Harry, but. Uh, Meghan Markle, you know, U.S. is racist. U.S. is a terrible place. Well, where did they move to the United States so that they could film a Netflix documentary, <laughs> docu series, which is now I think they may have overtaken Tiger King, their docu series, or maybe it's up there with 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 Tiger King, but it, it's done very well. Uh, but the United States, whether it's investors, whether it's people, it's still the place where people want to be. So. If you own real estate or just investments in the U.S., that's that's a good thing because it's still the hotspot, regardless of how much people may say they hate it. And of course, the media is going to give a huge microphone to those types of people, but they're not representative of of the truth. I agree. All right. So uh, regarding Big Cat Rescue, now that's a nonprofit, correct? Yes. So how how did you fund? How are you? It can't be cheap taking care of how how many cats did you have? What was the peak number of cats you had at one point, and what year? The most cats we ever had were about two hundred cats, and that was in the nineties, maybe the early two thousands. We currently have forty one cats, and the sanctuary for the first eleven years could not fund itself. I had to fund it from the real estate business. But in the 12th year, it finally managed to break even. And it's been improving every year since then. So, well, it was improving every year since then until 2019. 
it's just taken a nosedive since then because losing that tour revenue was losing a million dollars a year. It cost yeah. it cost me about three and a half million dollars a year to run the sanctuary, and the the million that we got from the tour revenue was what we could put into reserves. And the reason the reserves are so important is we lived through 9-11. And when that happened, all of the donations stopped. They only went to human causes, mostly in New York. All Mm. of the tourism stopped. People were terrified. They weren't flying anywhere. And I had, I don't even know, maybe 150 cats at that time. And I had $20,000 left. It was going to carry me for like a week. (laughs) I just about lost my mind. And I used that $20,000 and actually hired a consultant. First time I ever did that. And they did one of those strengths, weaknesses. Yeah, SWOT analysis. Yes. They learned in business school. And weirdly enough, their biggest, my biggest strength was that nobody had ever heard of us. (laughs) So it was like, okay, there's a big market out there if we can just reach it. And so I started really focusing on that and did manage to turn it around. The cats didn't have to go hungry a single day and it's managed to climb back from there to be as financially stable as it is. Well, talking about the, the cost, so 200 cats and these are, these animals aren't eating, you know, I've got a, a two year old son who you give him a uh, half a pack of nuts and he's, he's good for the next five hours. We're not talking a few nuts here and there. We're talking these animals, like what do they mostly eat? It must be very, very large and expensive, whatever they're eating on a daily basis. And then the, I don't even know if they're called veterinarians, a type of doctor who takes care of wild cats. Uh, Your average vet's probably going to stay away. Uh, But you have medical bills. Then you have all the upkeep of the property. I'm a real estate investor myself. My co-host is a real estate investor. And even owning two small single family houses can get expensive. So I can't even imagine the upkeep on the landscaping, the the food, the water. I mean, please go on and share what else there is. <laughs> uh, well, we have eight big cats. So those are tigers. We have a jaguar and then 33 small cats. The eight big cats will eat on average about nine pounds a day. And if you figure beef right now is like over $5 a pound um, and then chickens like $1.80 a pound, calculate that by how many pounds a day they're eating. And then the small cats, even though they're way smaller, bobcats, servals, and caracals, they eat about three pounds a day because they're much more active and they burn that energy off. And so you've got all of that that you have to calculate in, which is somewhere in the neighborhood of, I don't know, $1,500, $2,000 a year just in the food. And then you're right, the vet care is expensive. Thankfully, one of our interns married my daughter. He went to vet school and when he graduated, he came to be our vet. And he worked with a vet that we had had that had been donating her time for years. And so um, he's now still our vet, even though they're divorced, they still have a good relationship with each other. But we have to pay him. So we've got money invested in that. And then just you know, dealing with fleas and ticks. Here in Florida, you've got fleas and ticks and mosquitoes, and we don't want those things biting the cat. Mm-hmm. And the Brevecto that we use for the tigers, it's $42 per pill. And the tiger will eat three or four of those every quarter. And so if you imagine all of that, you know, times how many cats and how many pills, it's just ridiculous how much just the flea treatments cost. And then there's dewormers or there's emergency medical issues when somebody decides they're going to eat the palm fronds that are in their cage and they get all backed up with that and have to have it surgically removed. Um, it's all of our animal care, thankfully, has been done by volunteers all these years. So we didn't have a lot of um, staffing. So staff. even like the veterinary, like you brought up your, so is it your son-in-law, your ex-son-in-law who was the the, the vet or? He still is our vet, but He's there's always. another vet who had also donated her time for probably 15 years. So they're just donating their 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 time and and, and the vets. I'm sure you had many veterinarians who were like, I don't want to get near these animals. Yeah, we saw that, um, you know, whenever we do a, a rescue of a bobcat, the only cats that are legal to release are those who are actually born in the wild. And we do bobcat rehab, rescue, and release. And so, well, not in that order, rescue, rehab, and release. <laughs> and 
um, usually those cats get hit by cars at like three o'clock in the morning. And so yeah. when you come in at three o'clock in the morning, are you going to be able to get your vet to come out and donate their time? Or do you have to go to one of these all night clinics? And one of the places we use, <clears throat> actually all of the places now that we used to go, no longer allow any kind of exotic animals, not because of us, but, <laughs> but they don't do it anymore. And so, and it's for the reasons that you, you said, you know, they're just concerned about somebody in their, their uh, practice getting bitten or scratched or a cat getting loose or God only knows what can happen with wild yeah. animals. How did you become very comfortable with these big cats? Like, did you grow up around lions and tigers? Like, if you just threw me into a wildcat zoo, I'd probably just shrivel into a ball and pray that nobody would eat me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we never touch them. Uh, we don't trust them. They're apex predators. And anybody who thinks that they're going to make a friend out of a lion or a tiger is delusional. Okay, you well, that's how Joe Exotic made it seem. He just made it seem like, oh, this is my, like, good friend, you know? And <laughs> People who are using animals that way to make other people think that they're special, they're using animals that are under five years old. They haven't reached sexual maturity. So mentally, they're like kindergartners running around. And they could still bite you or kill you by accident, but they're not mature and trying to kill you. In the <laughs> wild, a mother tiger will kill her offspring or they will kill her for the territory once they become adults. And so all these people that say, oh, if you raise it, it'll be just like your own pet or your own child. And it's like, no, <laughs> that's not what they are like when they grow up. So all of so even the mother will kill her own kids for food, yeah, for territory, for territory, not even food. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, all these cats that you see people using in circus acts and uh, nightclub acts and at these roadside zoos, they're all just a bunch of kittens. They might be they're just a bunch of babies. Pounds, but they're kittens. They're just a bunch of babies, like like my kids. Wow, I I'm learning so much. So so that I remember that documentary that came out a long time. The famous one of the guy who was raising a lion, and then the lion went away, and then he went out to the jungle in Asia or somewhere and reunited with the lion. That was like a big a big lion, and they hugged and danced and had a good time like do you know what i'm talking about yeah. is that real or is that just uh, once one out of a million well it's christian the lion and yep. it was a couple of guys in london and they had released the cat on some privately owned land in south africa and they did go back to visit the cat and the cat did hug them like you saw but when you look at the the pictures and the videos of that you'll notice that the lion doesn't have a mane yet. He's just got these little sprigs sticking out, which means he's about three years old. He's just a baby. And by the time he was an adult, he ended up disappearing. And they think it's because he was killing cattle in a local village and they killed him for it. Oh. It's not the romantic story everybody likes to share online. That's not. Um, I think our listeners, you just upset them, but that's okay. We want to hear the truth. <laughs> yeah, it's it's never what people, even the the older case of Elsa the lion, that whole born free nonsense. It was the same thing there. You know, as soon as she got to be an adult, she got in trouble and got killed. When when he's, the lion got in trouble and got killed, got in trouble by killing cattle because okay. they're not afraid of people, so they go right into the village and they're like, that's a lot easier to catch than a zebra for crying out loud, and then they end up being killed for doing that. Oh, that's that's really sad. Um, wow, this is this is really good. Now I, I want to wrap up the real estate talk and and wrap up the interview as well. Are there any final thoughts you? Well, well, first off, you made a statement. You, but before we get to your final thoughts, you said that you were using the real estate business to fund Big Cat Rescue, the sanctuary. So was that just through the cash flow? Like, did you have tenants who were paying you on, on a lot of that real estate or you were just selling off assets or taking out like um, refinancing and taking out cash, reverse, reverse mortgages or how are you getting those <laughs> funds? Yeah, I, I do not mortgage anything. I, I pay cash for everything and wow. I never finance anything. I never refinance anything. I took out a uh, credit line on my house one time just because I needed some quick cash, but I paid it back like, I don't know, 90 days later and never took it out again. 
So um, you never, even back in the eighties, you would, well, it was so cheap, $2,000 for a property. So it was just straight cash for everything. Yes. Which has made me pretty much, um, debt free. Well, debt free. And I, you know, I'm not up at night worrying about how I'm going to pay my mortgage because in 2020, when Biden decided that nobody had to pay their mortgage anymore. That meant all of my tenants, all of my mortgagees that were owing me money, they stopped paying. And if I had to still be paying a bank, that would have been a horrible situation. And I'm still trying to recover from that because some of these people got a year behind and I, I availed myself of the... Um, it happened years. to me, not a year, but it happened to me where I had tenants. They teach you in, in these real estate classes, debt is an investor's best friend, which it is. It, it can be. But you just bring up a situation like what happened in 2020, 2021, and then boom, you're not able to pay. 2008, similar thing happened. You've got to make those payments to the bank or the mortgage company. If you can't, boom, you're screwed. You can't sleep at night. So it's it's an interesting concept and idea that you bring out because I'm all about debt, for, at least when it comes to cash flow generating assets. But I completely understand where you're coming from with paying all cash. I, I completely get it. So all of the money that was coming in was either from rental properties that I had or people. What I find interesting is, you know, I said that I sell it with 12 months on time and then I deed it over. You would be amazed how many years some of my people have been in their properties i mean i'm talking like 12 15 years they've been trying to get 12 payments in a row on time so that they can qualify for turning it into a mortgage and they just can't do it and you know i, I work with them and haven't thrown them out and some of them run three months behind four months behind but if they just you know quit buying beer and cigarettes long enough to make their payments on time 12 months in a row then they would be eating off, they'd be paying off that um, interest on their property and it'd be their property and they'd be the ones making this income. But people just make really bad decisions. In general. Yeah. yeah, that's that's uh, pretty, pretty awesome. I've got to share that with several of my real estate investor friends. So before we sign off, I believe you are a con contestant or going to be a contestant on the show The Wheel. Can you tell us a little bit more? about that? Actually, I, I was already on it. It was a few okay. weeks ago that they aired the segment that I was in and I was their big cat expert. That was a fun opportunity for uh, a little bit of quick money for the sanctuary and me and didn't take a whole lot of my time. I, I turned down way more of those kinds of things than I actually do though, because I just can't be away from the sanctuary. Yeah. And, and, and going back to the, the 40, 45 or so cats that you have now. So how are you, you're funding those now because of the publicity you've gotten, you've gotten a bunch of donations or you're funding it through the real estate or because you're missing out on the million dollars of revenue. And I know you've cut down on the number of cats from 300 or so to, to 40. So how are you, how are you funding big cat rescue right now? And, and the other, do you own any other sanctuaries around the country? No, this is the only okay. sanctuary. Thank God. And okay. What has caused the decline in the number of cats is that our first year we rescued one bobcat, but the next year we rescued 56 bobcats and lynx, and then 28 the next year, and then 22 the next year. So all of those cats aged out. You know, they die in zoos. They usually die by the time they're 12 to 16 years old. At our place, they live into their late teens and early 20s, but they were all in their 20s um, probably five years ago, and so they passed on. And that's why there's been such a huge drop in the number of cats at the sanctuary. But like I said earlier, I have to raise three and three and a half million dollars every year just to keep the sanctuary going. And the extra million that we could raise through the tour revenue is what we were putting aside for a future for the cats. So I'm not getting that because we are closed to the public, but I still have to raise three and a half million a year. And that's done through donations. There's no government grants. And thankfully, we've been able to do it with the donors that we have. Donations really dropped in 2020 and 2021, and I don't know how in 2022 um, from our peak in 2019, and I don't know how much of that's due to the economy and people being worried about their own futures because of COVID or how much of it is because of the negative impact from Tiger King. I don't think it's a negative impact of Tiger. I, I do think it's economic related, but I do think things are going to get better. 2020 was rough. 2021 
what was rough on inflation. 2022 also was was rough as well. So if you haven't gotten those numbers, I, I wouldn't be expecting much out of 2022. But uh, hopefully things turn around for sure. Carol Baskin, CEO of Bidcat Rescue, megastar of the hit Netflix docuseries Tiger King. If you haven't seen it yet, you may not know exactly all the details that we've been talking about. So check it out there. Um, on, on Netflix, Tiger King, her website is bigcattv.com and bigcatrescue.org. And if you want to donate, I believe that we could go to bigcatrescue.org and, and donate through there. Yes. Okay. So definitely do that. Carol, any final thoughts you want to share with our listener or anything else you want to promote? You know, the only thing I would suggest is that if you see people posing with cubs on social media, it's now illegal. So let them know that and let them know that it was always cruel, but now it's illegal. I actually, I, I was going to ask you that because when you said, if you, when you see all these people glorifying these animals, they're just little babies. They're like, you know, my children, they're really clueless. So I remember this was years, this was like a decade ago on these dating profiles, like on Tinder and stuff, you would see, uh, I, I, would, I wouldn't see this on the women's side, but women would tell me, oh, I'd see guys posing with, you know, a lion or a tiger, or whatever, not in the United States and Thailand or something. And so I thought, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. But now it's illegal, illegal meaning it's illegal to pose, but it's not illegal to post the picture, right? Or is that considered kind of like kiddie porn and therefore, you know, you can be arrested for that? Well, I guess it depends on when you touched the cat. If you touched it prior to December 20th, it may not be illegal, even though it's a stupid thing to do because people who know about the abuse involved in that think you're a jerk when they see it. But after, if you petted the cub after 20 or after December 20th of 2022, then you have just admitted <laughs> that you have broken the law. Well, if there's one takeaway that people should learn from this, it's don't take pictures, those nice, cute pictures that you see with the, whether it's a cub or a wild, big adult, like, don't do it. It's number one, not safe. And number two, if you get away with it, it's now illegal. So you will it, you'll be criminally prosecuted yeah it could be five years in jail and a twenty thousand dollar fine not worth it so don't do it stay away just <laughs> listen to this episode again so carol paskin thanks for joining us on the work from home show this has been a great interview to all our listeners check us out at workfromhomeshow.com that's www.workfromhomeshow.com get on our mailing list there follow us on social media if you have any questions if you want us to relay any information to carol if you want to donate don't know where you forgot the website already just email us hello at workfromhomeshow.com that's hello at workfromhomeshow.com and until next week keep on working from home <laughs>